What is the likelihood that the U.S. public, which is indeed becoming more cynical, there's no question about that, uh, what's the likelihood it'll just turn away from questions like politics and foreign policy and so on? Is that the... Yeah. yeah. That yeah. Well, I, you know, I, look, you can't predict tomorrow's weather, right? To try to predict human affairs is totally hopeless. If you look at the record of predicting human affairs, it is, uh, you know, you, you might as well uh, draw lots or something. Uh, it's a much too complicated business to predict. It's the kind of thing you try to do something about, you don't predict. Uh, if you look at past history, you can find all kind of analogies and differences. So for example, take the United States. Uh, in the 19th, we've been through periods. This is not the first period of the kind we are now experiencing. I mean, it's never identical to what happened before, but there is a kind of a cycle. Uh, there's a, there, uh, you look through history of the United States and England, the two most advanced societies, democratic societies since the early 1820s, there have been repeated periods uh, which have been called, have been hailed, you know, as the end of history, utopia the masters, the people are driven down into apathy and cynicism, the guys who ought to own the place run everything, perfection has been reached. Uh, the first such period was in England in the 1830s. Uh, remember that the classical, uh, Adam Smith was not the founder of what's called classical economics. He was pre-capitalist, he had all kind of weird ideas, and so we'll put him aside. But something like what's called neoliberalism is found in the work of Ricardo and Malthus and other economists of that period. And they had to t teach a very hard lesson, a new lesson, new in human history. The lesson was that human beings have absolutely no value. Okay, they have no intrinsic value. That's new. You know, if you go back to say feudal society, uh, everybody had a place, maybe a lousy place, but a place, you know, you had a right to a certain place in the society and you belonged there and the society somehow had a responsibility to keep you there, even if you were a slave. But they had a new, there was a new idea coming along post enlightenment, post classical liberalism, post Adam Smith or Jefferson, and that was coming along in England roughly in the 1820s. And that was that people have no rights uh, they have only the rights that they can obtain in the labor market, period. If you can't get enough to survive in the labor market, then starve or go somewhere else. Now, in those days, you could go somewhere else. Like, you know, you could go to the United States or Australia or Canada, and a little problem about some people living there, but that wasn't too serious. Uh, so that uh, sort of meant something. That was the message. Uh, and that's not easy to teach people. You know, it's kind of hard to drive out of people's heads this strange idea that human beings have some intrinsic rights apart from what they can gain in the labor market. Uh, but it looked by the 19th, 1830s as if it had sort of won. It was written into the legislation, you know, looked fine and so on. There was only one small problem. Uh, the British Army was spending most of its time and effort putting down rebellions. Uh, because people couldn't get it into their thick heads that they don't have any rights. So they did all kind of crazy things. They were mutinying and, you know, strange things happening. Uh, and finally, something even worse happened. The idea started to spread that if we don't have any right to live, you don't have any right to rule, you know. And that was serious. Uh, you started getting chartis chartism and, uh, you know, the labor movement started organizing and it was all very subversive. And fortunately, the science, uh, which according to Ricardo had the, uh, was equivalent to Newton's laws of gravitation, the science turns out to be kind of flexible. So it changed a little bit and it suddenly turned out that, yeah, you have to have something like what later on is called social democracy. Uh, so the, there is a right to live and you have to have a social contract and so on. Okay, you go back, go another 30, 40 years, say the 1880s, looked like the same thing was happening. Uh, uh, again, there was talk about perfection, finality, you know, nobody has any rights and so on and so forth. Again, the thing blew up. Same was going on in the United States. I won't go on with England because they did establish a pretty stable social contract, which 
change, only changed very recently, in fact. Uh, in the United States, which had a much harsher history in this respect, uh, the 1890s were a period of real violent repression of individual rights. They're called the gay 90s, and they were gay for some people, uh, but not for working people in Western Pennsylvania, for example. I won't go through the history, but you ought to know it if you don't. Uh, and then it looked like utopia again. Okay, uh, by the 1920s, it really looked perfect. Uh, so there's an important book on labor history by America's, by the leading labor historian, David Montgomery, uh, who, uh, Yale University, it's called The Rise and Fall of the House of Labor. And the fall of the House of Labor that he's talking about is the 1920s. That's when labor was completely smashed. The leading figure in the labor movement, Eugene Debs, was in jail uh, because he refused to recognize the nobility of Wilson's war. Uh, the unions were completely smashed. Uh, you couldn't have meetings. I mean, you know, it was very undemocratic. I mean, in fact, he calls it a very undemocratic America, but it looked like perfection, finality, end of history, wonderful. Uh, ten years later, the whole thing blew up. You could ask that, the question you were asking could have been raised then. In fact, could have been raised in the gay 90s, too, uh, or the 1830s. Uh, turned out ten, ten years later, the whole thing blew up. Uh, workers are taking over factories. I mean, that's half a step before kicking out the bosses altogether and just running them. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the, and they were, it, the United States was forced into a kind of social contract called the New Deal. Uh, the 19, there was a big attack huge corporate propaganda, you know, big, you know, fear and concern about this. By the 1950s, it looked like it was back in shape again. That was a period of quiescence, you know, very little happening. People are cynical and apathetic, uh, end of ideology, it was called in those days. 1960s, everything blew up again. You know, by now we're into your lifetimes, you know what happened. Uh, and right after the 60s, the ferment of the 60s, again, the same story an attempt to drive everybody back into their holes, uh, narrow the sphere of democratic participation, you know, uh, put the wealth back where it belongs into the pockets of the rich folk and so on. And that carries us pretty much until today. Well, it's a repetition, you know, it's not the first time. And furthermore, it's not just a cycle, it's a cycle, it's a spiral that goes upwards. So you think about each one of these periods, you're better off than last time. So, for example, now there's like a problem about uh, maintaining, defending Social Security and main defending some kind of medical care for somebody, okay, the, let's say the elderly and the poor. There were, that wasn't a problem in the 1920s because there was no Social Security and there was no medical care. In fact, even in the, 19, in the 1960s, there was no problem about defending medical care because there wasn't any, okay. Uh, and if you look case by case, I think what you find is a gradual growth in, I don't know, I would call, it's a value judgment, so I'd call it civilization, you call it whatever you like. Uh, but anyway, a pretty steady change in something, which is a recognition of some kind of intrinsic human rights. And you get it beaten down and then you start again, but from a higher level. And I think we're at a higher level now than in, ever before, you know, in these past cycles. So where's it going to go next? Your guess is as good as anyone else's. No one's ever been able to predict in the past. Nobody can predict now. Uh, you can just say that, yes, we're back in another familiar period, and it could lead to something like, you know, the movements of the 60s and the 30s, or it could lead to fascism. Nobody knows.